Lopez, but welcome back everybody to the weekly Holistic Actions webinars, where we help you all put all your animal symptoms into context, into the holistic context, and interpret them holistically and decide what to do. And we are doing it this month for your pets with cancer symptoms, or pets trying to prevent cancer symptoms, and manage them if they do arise in a holistic manner. That's uh, the essence of the, the One Health and One Medicine theme that Dr. Bob Goldstein, who is our presenter for tonight, who Dr. Christina will introduce in a moment, that is what Earth Animal is all about, Earth and Animal working together. And that's, that's the essence of One Health, One Medicine is using nature to heal the body. And if we have time, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But Dr. Christina, why don't you take it away while I let people in? Sure. So one of the wonderful things about Bob is I love when we have holistic veterinarians who graduated a long time ago and are still <laughs> out there <laughs> really doing the holistic. Carvel Teekert, yourself. So Bob graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1967. So yay for doing this for so long and for continuing to create new programs, new work. And um, he'll be talking about the different things that, he, that he's been involved in and resources for you um, that he's created. Um, so I'm going to let him take it away, but I just, again, my hat's off to you for all you've done, Bob, over the years, you and your brother. <laughs> well, thank you, Christine. I pre appreciate that. So what I need to do is hit this share button, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And where is right here? Okay. And now hit play. And now or hit slideshow, uh, slide whatever that show. is. Slideshow is right in the middle. Um, I don't Up see. top, animations, and then slideshow is right next to it. Must be here. I'm being covered by your yeah. screen sharing. You can you can move that. You can I can move, move that. that. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. There you go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Is that okay? It's okay. You can see? Yes, Perfect. we can see it. It's wonderful. Okay. okay. Well, uh, obviously, there's a lot to cover. Obviously, cancer is obviously almost epidemic in dogs and cats. And to cover everything about cancer in in less than an hour is obviously very difficult. So what we try to do is make sure that especially if you're dealing with an animal with cancer, that you have resources available to you. And so throughout the uh, presentation, we will make sure that you have a resource to go to <clears throat> in case you're dealing with cancer. Uh, I will go through, well, I, I kind of have it here. Uh, obviously I graduated at University of Pennsylvania uh, Christina was correct. I graduated in 1969. Um, okay, so this is basically what we're going to cover. You know, we, we're, we're going to go into the accepted cause of cancer. We're going to go into prevention, what you can do if you're on the prevention side. Uh, if you happen to be, unfortunately, in the treatment side, we will give you the resources that you need and the available options uh, for you. Um, and then I think at the end, as I told Jeff, I'm going to be a little bit more provocative uh, because if you visit the statistics on cancer, it is absolutely frightening. Uh, you know, I've been practicing 50 years. And if anything, the incidence of cancer is going in the wrong way, not in the right way. So I will try to give you some research that's being done that might, uh, might help uh, in the prevention of cancer going forward. Okay, so uh, the re only reason I'm putting up the books, you know, we wrote a, uh, a uh, textbook for veterinarians and an over-the-counter book. And, and the reason that I'm bringing that up is that 
I learned something in doing the research for the veterinary textbook. You know, when you look at the cause of cancer and we, in this textbook, we covered every single type of cancer. And when you look at, when you look at the cause of cancer, they're really, really usually say at the end of a long dissertation of too many carbohydrates, environmental and all those things, Really, it comes down to cause unknown. However, the common denominator in all cancers is inflammation. So we know a lot about inflammation, a lot more we know about it than when I first started practicing 50 years ago. So if inflammation is the common denominator, that sort of gives you something that you can do on the prevention side to see if you can prevent the cause of inflammation and therefore indirectly prevent cancer. And that's really what we'll try to get through in this, uh, in this lecture. All right, so uh, inflammation is numerous causes of inflammation. Obviously diet, if it's an inflammatory producing diet or as opposed to a neutral diet, it could cause inflammation. Highly processed foods, uh, and there's research now being done on advanced glycation end products, which actually cause, can start the, the process of, uh, of uh, inflammation. Uh, glyphosates in food and all sorts of toxins that are in where these animals are raised for food can also be a source of, uh, of inflammation. Obviously vaccines have been associated with inflammation, especially over vaccination. Um, natural remedies as compared to flea and tick, insecticides, and chronic use of medication. So all of these things potentially have the, the ability to create inflammation and set the stage going. Now, obviously, if you know, if you can avoid many of these things and minimize the amount of inflammation, you've taken a big step toward the prevention of cancer. All right, so basically what I did was I, 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 on the prevention side, I listed a number of things that all produce or are all part of this inflammatory process. Obviously genetics, and just so you know, 50 years ago when I started practicing, cancer was an, a, a, a disease of older animals and very, uh, very breed specific. So boxers, Rottweilers, golden retrievers, they were really prone to cancer. The majority of the mixed breeds and all the other breeds really were not prone to cancer. Uh, right now, what we're finding is cancer doesn't care anymore. No matter what the breed is, doesn't matter. And, it is, it, and I will show you some statistics that are showing you that the incidence of cancer is actually going in the wrong direction. So really, we need to take a step back and figure out what that cause is. And I will give you some insights as to the type of research that's going on that will, I believe, eventually help in the reduction of the incidence of cancer. So genetics is one. Obviously, what the, what the animal is fed is another. Obviously, the medications, flea and tick uh, uh, prevention and insecticides, vaccines. And one of the things that is often really not covered is the emotional state and the emotions especially in an anxiety ridden animal can actually reduce the immune system and set the stage for inflammation. So just, and I'll just quickly go through a couple of these. When I was started to practice, genetics were the main thing. And then over the years, it has gotten genetics because of proper breeding has gotten less and less and less. However, the incidence of diet created inflammation and the cause of cancer has gone up dramatically. And I will show you where that, uh, you know, where that falls. All right, so here is the statistics that I was talking about. 50% of the dogs over 10 years of age die of cancer and 32% of cats over 10 years of age die of cancer. That is light years more than it was when I started practice 50 years ago. So I think that while I am going to go through a number of different areas where prevention can be done, what's in the control of the pet parent, 
I think that we need to, and we'll do it toward the end of this le lecture, we have to take another look at other things that we should be doing on the diet side that perhaps is creating this high incidence of cancer. And I'll get to that you know, toward the end of this uh, presentation. So this quickly, the immune system, as you know, the skin, the eyes, the membranes of the mouth, what is new and the research that is being right, done right now is in the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome contains approximately 70% of the immune system. So if we could support the inflammation, it, uh, so reduce inflammation in the gut microbiome and support a healthy microbiome, that plus the GI plus the immune system, we can go a long way in the prevention of cancer. All right, so this is just you know, the, the, the things that really affect the immune system. And you can see that obviously I've already mentioned this, you know, allergens, uh, flea and tick, a chronic use of medication, over vaccination, uh, you know, automatic vaccinations when probably not needed in an area that might not even have that particular disease, uh, free radicals from e either toxins, allergens, or improper diet. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, a diet, in my estimation, has risen to the top of the pack. And I'll explain to you what is going on in the diet area that could be creating and uh, uh, causing cancer. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so just quickly, the immune system you know, I, I think we've lost our way with the immune system. I think back in the early 1900s, uh, Dr. Burnett, he created what was, he founded, I'm sorry, not created, he discovered the immune surveillance uh, system. And he basically said that the immune system is there to protect the body from viruses, bacteria, and even cancer. And what happens is that an immune system that is just totally out of balance will lose its ability of surveillance and allow the cancer to grow. I think that as a profession, we have lost our way a little bit in the fact is that we don't focus on the immune system as much as we should. We really focus on therapies, on chemotherapy, on on uh, immunotherapy, on radiation therapy, and other natural therapies, instead of really supporting the immune system and spend more time on the prevention side instead of the treatment side. And I will just give you a couple, toward the end of this, I will give you a couple of things that you can think about in that area. All right, so I'll just go through each individual one. If you're on the prevention side, these are a number of things that you can do for your animal that really will help to one, reduce inflammation. And therefore, if you can reduce inflammation, you can then go a long way in the prevention of cancer. Obviously diet at the top, a neutral diet that does not evoke inflammation is really important. Exercise, fresh air, the emotional status of the animal is really important. And I will spend a little bit of time with that. Uh, and so you understand that a, a out of balance behavioral system can reduce the immune function and really can contribute to cancer also. Obviously reducing the reliance on insecticides and chronic medication and obviously vaccines, this goes without saying. Okay, so the, what Dr. Burnett found the immune system, the mechanism that he determined was what is causing the immune system to lose its ability to, of surveillance is basically what's called an autoimmune process. All the veterinarians on the phone have been trained like I have and understand what an autoimmune response is. However, it is really, really important that the uh, autoimmune response is kicked into gear by inflammation, the same inflammation that we're speaking about that can actually prevent cancer. So for instance, if you have an inflammatory process in the joints, we diagnose it as arthritis. If you have an inflammatory process in the skin, we diagnose it as atopic dermatitis. If you have a autoimmune process in the organs, 
it will eventually lead to cancer. So basically the autoimmune process is what kicks the body into a degenerating state caused by inflammation that sets the stage for cancer. The answer is if you remove the inflammation and you stop the autoimmune response, then what you've done is gone a long way in favor of prevention of cancer. And that's what pet parents have in their ability, the prevention of cancer. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So that was on the prevention side and that was basically the, in the causative side of cancer. So basically, if you're in an unfortunate position where you, your animal is diagnosed with cancer, the first thing in practicing for 40 years, the first thing we told every single person is to take a deep breath, take a step back and do not panic because there are things that you can do. And equally as important, your dog or a cat are totally attached to your emotions. So if you walk around checking a lump on a dog that has just been uh, uh, diagnosed by cancer, you're putting focus on that. And that's really what, you're not, what you should not do. So first thing you should do is take a deep breath, take a step back and understand there are numerous things that you can do on the prevention side. Obviously we've gone over and I will go a little bit more on diet a wholesome diet and things that you can do. Vaccination wisdom in my practice, if an animal was diagnosed with cancer, I tell that person never, ever, ever get another vaccine while that animal is being treated for cancer. Obviously, if you're reliant on chronic use of medication or painkillers, obviously try to find natural ways to prevent that. Insecticides are equally as damaging, so try to find uh, flea and tick prevention, because if you can prevent a flea and tick, you don't have to treat it. And you know that the insecticides are going to instill uh, inflammation. Support of the microbiome and, and, and the reduction of inflammation. There is numerous research being carried on right now on different types of diet that can really help to reduce inflammation and strengthen the mi microbiome. And that is really important because 70% of the immune system is in that microbiome. Obviously, the emotions are, in my opinion, equally as important because dogs and cats are very intuitive and they will pick up on negative emotions. So try to keep your negative emotions away from the animal. And then obviously, uh, working with an integrative veterinary oncologist. So I practiced 30 years in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and into early the 2000s. And you know, I dealt with numerous, numerous uh, veterinary oncologists. And at that time, it was either you did what the oncologist said, or you went for an alternative therapy like an integrative approach or we would put together. There were a couple of oncologists, I would say, that were a little bit more open to including integrative therapies, but the majority said, the only therapy you should do is chemotherapy and that's it. <coughs> I think that one of the blessings that we do have now, you know, 35, 40 years later, is the fact that there are now integrative oncologists who can really, really help and really offer other things beside chemotherapy, other things beside radiation therapy, other things that could be a lot less invasive, inflammatory causing, and really in helping your animal with cancer. So <coughs> genetics, obviously uh, genetics when I was young and practicing, was much more important. It's less important right now. Uh, one story that, that stands out is probably about 15 years ago. And I had a client in, uh, in, in the University of California, Davis, uh, with a golden retriever with lymphosarcoma. And at that time, and I think it goes back to the either late 80s or early, 19, or early 90s. And she went into, I told her that probably best thing to do 
you got the diagnosis, go to the veterinary school, talk to the oncologist, find out what the oncologist said, and then I will help guide you as to what type of therapy. And at that point, University of California at Davis had a separate waiting room for animals with cancer. And the lady took her two or three or four year old golden retriever with lymphosarcoma into the waiting room and was absolutely flawed. She said there was 20 animals in the waiting room and 19 of them were golden retrievers. And she said, what is going on? She called me in this absolutely in tears. And so genetics, as I said, used to be very, very important. I think nowadays that it has become less important, probably because breeders are much more aware and trying to breed cancer out of the line. Um, so I think that uh, uh, genetics is not as important as it was, but diet has moved into that number one position. Okay, so on the diet side, obviously you wanna have a diet that is not producing inflammation, a diet that supports the microbiome. And here are some areas that where I think, where certainly my research is, and I think a number of integrative and research type of veterinarians are working on this also. The, the pollutant effect and the, and uh, that, you know, glyso, you know gly, uh, glyphosates and, you know, a Roundup and all those chemicals that are used in feedlots are really, they're finding that they are accumulating in the muscle of the, uh, of the food animal and basically are then being fed to our dogs and cats and certainly small amounts of poison each day uh, uh, in the diet is now setting the stage for cancer. I feel that there's a lot to that. And I think that the, and the other part will come out in the next slide. So between making sure that the diet is not contaminated, things like Roundup and, and to feed organic whenever possible is really, really very important. Ketogenic, uh, ketogenic diets have really proven to be pretty good. Obviously, high, high fat, high protein, very, very little pro, uh, uh, carbohydrates. The problem that I see with that is that the meat in there could be potentially contaminated and you gotta be very careful. Plant-based diets are getting a lot of attention right now. And some of the research that we are do uh, being done at Earth Animal is in the plant-based sp space. And not because we're feeding fruits and vegetables, because the technology of producing proteins, amino acids, and essential fatty acids from the plant has light years ahead of where it was. And we feel that one of the possibilities is to produce a protein plant-based diet that does not have any of the, of, the, of the pollutant effect that is found with meat. And we think that that's really one of the big areas of research going forward and potentially to reduce the incidence of cancer. Okay, and, and then the second part of that is beside the, the potential pollutants that are going in that. And by the way, there are, num there are numerous uh, uh, holistic veterinarians, Richard Pitcairn, who came up with the same time that I did, is certainly one of the big uh, supporters of that, meaning that there, he feels that, that there are a lot of contaminants that are in the pet food, in this factory farmed area that are really going into these animals and really setting the stage for not only uh, cancer, but other serious diseases. So what you can do, obviously the, the other part of it beside the contamination is the, is the processing. So this, uh, there's a lot of research, there's research being done at the veterinary school in Georgia uh, by Dr. Bonnage on what's called uh, advanced glycation end products, which are end product fragments that can create havoc and inflammation and they come from over-processing food. So if you can eliminate the potential pollutant effect and minimally process it so you're not creating these, anti, these inflammatory producing end products, 
you have gone a long way to reducing inflammation with, with foods that are not causing the inflammation and giving the animals ability and microbiome and strong immune system to help prevent this. And I think this is the research that, that is being going on. And I think that I'm very excited about it because I think that there's a lot of things that could come out of that that could be very beneficial. All right, so basically just very quickly, the microbiome is extremely, extremely complex, but 70% of the immune system is in that microbiome. And we are doing currently doing research with uh, Dr. Gans out in California on the microbiome, where we're testing it against various different types of food to see what effect <coughs> the diet has on the microbiome itself. So the microbiome is really coming uh, a center stage, along with the elimination of, of the pollutants that I've met uh, uh, that I've mentioned and the reduction of these AGE, these advanced glycation end products from over-processing food like in kibble. <coughs> I think we're gonna see a lot of good things come out of that. Okay, obviously vaccination with wisdom is really, really very, very important. Um, in my practice, and I'm just gonna give you this quickly, this would be ideal for a dog, ideal for a cat, Gene Dodds is the expert in protocols. If you're dealing with a veterinarian and that doesn't understand what you're talking about, about the adverse effects of vaccine, tell your veterinarian to reach out to Dr. Dodd and get Dr. Dodd's protocol because it says everything about minimizing the potential side effects of vaccines. So that would be my advice to anybody uh, who's dealing with a veterinarian who just doesn't understand the potential adverse effects of vaccines. Okay, obviously we talked about medication, uh, obviously, and fleas and ticks. You know, fleas, ticks, heartworm medication and chronic use of medication, all that's gonna do is create inflammation. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. <clears throat> I have always, I've in 1967, 68 and 68, uh, 67 and 68, I was part of the team that developed the flea collar for the Shell Oil Company, which was the first flea collar that was commercially available. And it was an organic phosphate uh, uh, flea collar. And I learned then when I was back in the army that using the animal's body as a delivery system to kill a flea and tick just did not make sense to me. And so based upon that, you know, I created a number of different natural preventive type of things instead of relying on uh, uh, fleas and, uh, I'm sorry, insecticides to do that. So that's just a personal philosophy of mine. But if you can prevent fleas and ticks with natural products and do not have to rely on medication to do it, then I think you're way ahead of the game. All right, obviously on the strengthening of the immune system, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, antioxidants, you know, uh, medicinal herbs, medicinal mushrooms, uh, Chinese and Western herbals. Um, and I'm listing them all here because, you know, within a 45 minute period, it's almost impossible to go through everyone. Jamie can help you if you're interested in finding out about any of these. Jamie can direct you to people, to veterinarians who are using these type of therapies in animals for the treatment of cancer. Okay. <clears throat> Probably the, in my opinion, one of the greatest things that have happened on the cancer side is the, is the formation of integrative veterinary oncologists. You know, as I told you back in the 80s and the 70s and 80s, it was me, uh, and a couple other veterinarians and, and uh, you know, board certified oncologists and we didn't, we never ever saw eye to eye. But now what has happened is that there are many now veterinary oncologists who are integratively oriented. And in my opinion, that is absolutely a blessing for animals because an integrative veterinary oncologist is gonna look at other potential therapies that are gonna be 
better for the animal, more friendly, reduce side effects, and really create the same thing. So I think that that is a blessing. The three uh, oncologists that I have used over the years, uh, Dr. Trina Huzza, who's out in California, uh, she, her specialty is with CBD. She's doing a lot of research on the effect, the anti-cancer effect uh, of, of uh, CBD. Uh, Dr. Kendra Pope, who's in New Jersey, uh, she does uh, acupuncture, uh, Chinese herbal medicine, nutraceuticals. She actually does some mistletoe therapy, which I learned about in the middle 60s. Um, so that's, uh, Kendra is actually very, very good. And then Betsy Hershey, who's been around probably longer than all, all of them. Uh, she's out in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Jamie can help you get to, to, these, to these oncologists. They are great because they are one board certified oncologist. And number two, they have the, 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 uh, the experience with natural therapies that could be beneficial and really help your animal, especially if you're dealing with cancer. I, I'm sorry, especially if you're dealing with cancer therapy. Okay, so basically, I mean, basically, you, if you go to an oncologist and it's not an integrative oncologist, you're going to be given a chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or radiation therapy, or surgery. Um, you can have the option of adding integrative therapies to that, or you can have the option of doing integrative therapies alone. In my 35, 40 years of practicing in, in, a, in a cancer referral practice, I would say that the majority of people who came to me looking for the alternative therapies stayed away from chemotherapy and relied on the natural therapies. They just felt uncomfortable about using chemotherapy for their animal. Um, and I'm going to show you just a couple of cases so you could this list you could just see exactly what a typical therapy would would uh, would look like. Okay, so here's where Jamie can really help. <coughs> she, she can help you with finding uh, uh, Chinese herbs uh, that are available for you, or a practitioner who uses Chinese herbal medicine, or one of these uh, 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 integrative oncologists. Obviously, Jamie can also direct you to nutraceuticals, glandulars, vitamins, and minerals that are all very, very uh, supportive of not only the immune system, but also of the cancer process. Obviously, Dr. Dressler has adaptogens uh, and turmeric, and er uh, actually Earth Animal has an herbal uh, blend that is good for the immune system. Uh, uh, medicinal mushrooms, especially with a mangiosarcoma, has really, really proven to be pretty good. Uh, Rob Silver and, and Vet RX uh, Coriolis uh, is one of the good products that has it. Uh, immunity, uh, it, it's a little bit difficult to get right now, but those medicinal uh, mushrooms have really showed some promise, especially in serious cancers like hemangiosarcoma. Uh, Dr. Haza, as I said, is doing all her research on CBD and CBDA. Uh, Margot Roman is doing uh, uh, ozone therapy, and I know there are other veterinarians who are doing that also. Uh, Dr. Pope, beside acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine, is also working with mistletoe. And then, of course, the keto pet sanctuary, uh, uh, using the keto diet as part of the therapy to help prevent and treat cancer is also pretty good. So I've heard some pretty good things about that. Okay. All right, and don't last on the on this is don't forget the emotions. Your, your animals are are really very very intuitive and can really pick up on fear. And obviously, the biggest factor about cancer is the fear itself. And so, try to separate yourself and obviously support your animal's immune system as much as you can. Obviously, there are natural remedies. Our Earth animal has an emotional balanced flower essence, and obviously the old standby uh, rescue remedy is good for helping to balance the immune system. Okay, so I'm just going to come back to that because this is one of my pet projects going forward. As I said, 50% of the animals over 10 years will die of cancer and 32% of cats. This is now 
50 years later and is still, it's actually going in the wrong direction. And, and, and as I said, the original was, well, genetically prone. And I think that genetics has gotten improved. And I think that what is coming to light is the pollutant effect, the processing effect on diet is really concentrating, causing uh, 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 toxin causing materials in there and, and, and feeding those type of foods a little bit each day potentially is setting the stage for this increase in the diagnosis and death from cancer. So I think that the, <coughs> the current research that is being done, uh, you know, Dr. Kangas has spoken uh, obviously about uh, you know, uh, 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 pollutants and, and what the effect is potentially on cancer. Obviously, I, you know, I said Dr. Bonnage is doing research on the processing of food and showing that the potential AGE, the advanced glycation end products, potentially are causing the, the, inc the higher incidence in cancer. So based upon that, my own personal, what I am doing at Earth Animal is we are doing research on plant-based diets to see if we could use plant-based diets under a technology that supports the the nutritional component of dogs specifically. We will eventually try it with cats, but, with, but using that as potentially a way to improve the diet and potentially decrease the incidence of cancer going forward. Whether or not that can be done, I don't know. We're gonna be working in combination with several of the universities to see if we can actually put some teeth in that and really come up with something definitive that says these things that we have been doing, because we say high protein, moderate fat, low carbohydrate diet is the key for cancer. If those diets contain toxins, that a little bit of those toxins every day is causing the inflammation to go sky high and actually setting the stage for cancer, that is something that we definitively have to know about. So that's just one of my pet projects, but I just wanted you to make, a, make you aware that that kind of thinking process, thought process is going on. And I think that that's something that potentially could cause some enlightenment on the prevention of cancer going forward. Okay. All right, obviously, the, uh, and this is just a summary of, of those pollutant effects that, you know, the uh, glyphosate and the micro, you know, the microbiome and all these things that I just talked about. That's basically what is that, uh, that slide is going to summarize. Okay, so I'm just going to just quickly just give you some, you know, these are just strict, strictly from my own practice. <clears throat> this is to show you what a most of the people who come to me or have come to me over the years have come to me because they really do not want to do chemotherapy and they're, they really want to rely on the natural therapies. So I just gave you just a, a list of, you know, this was, um, you know, this was an animal that had stomach cancer diagnosed in 2012, uh, made her transition in 2019. That was seven years later. And she was on a combination of homeopathy, nutraceuticals, she was on the bl nutritional blood test when it was available, which is a combination of glandular and um, uh, uh, nutraceuticals. And then she was on a Chinese herbal program from Dr. Wen called Neo uh, uh, UG Plus. And she did incredibly well, obviously, for seven years. That was Nephi. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, this is uh, uh, Coco. Coco, uh, Jeff, can you see that? I'm a little bit blocked here. Can can you see the uh, pictures of the dog? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So this is uh, 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 Coco. Coco was diagnosed with uh, osteosarcoma. By the time it came to me, the amputation was already done. Obviously, it was diagnosed in 2010. Oh, let me put this aside. Obviously, and lived uh, you know another three years 
Obviously, the amputation did help because it removed the, the nidus of the cancer, but we put him on glandular support, homeopathic sarcode support. We put him on glandular support for the thyroid, thyroid and thymus glands, put him on an antioxidant, uh, AOX, PLX, put him on collagen complex because he was having trouble with the other leg. And um, obviously, a, a, at this point, it was a high protein, uh, moderate uh, fat, low carbohydrate diet. And obviously, um, uh, three years. You know, she lived for, uh, for three years. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Come on. Why, why can't I see this? Just... Okay, so this, uh, okay, this is a, uh, uh, this is Tetley, a short-haired uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, intestinal lymphoma. Um, this is one of our better cases. You know, this, you know, this cat lived five years with uh, intestinal lymphoma, obviously was on uh, homeopathics, was on immune boost and herbal. It was on glandulars to support the, the, the lymph system. Uh, this, you know, this cat also had low, values of potassium. So we make sure we supported the potassium and obviously was on a, uh, a, uh, a, natural, a natural type of diet. Okay, uh, Holly, this is actually uh, lived with, uh, with Jamie who ran my clinic for uh, so all those years. Obviously diagnosed in 2004 with lymphosarcoma, uh, went on a Chinese herbal nutritional blood test support program along with some uh, 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 medicinal mushrooms, um, and, and obviously did very, very well for two years. Um, and really day-to-day -day quality of life, really very important because during this treatment, obviously it was no side effects like you would see with chemotherapy. Okay, and this is Maple. Obviously Maple uh, had a skin cancer, which developed into more serious things like lung cancer, um, but obviously uh, diagnosed in 2010 and made her transition in 2014. All of these animals went on a nutraceutical uh, Chinese herbal remedy type of program without any chemotherapy and had obviously great day-to-day -day quality of life during the therapy and didn't have to rely on chemotherapy or anything like that. I believe that was the last one. Okay, Jeff, I'm not sure time-wise where we are, but that's all I had. I try to go through it as quickly as I can because I know we're on a short fuse. Great, that's fine. And we have questions. So that was wonderful. Um, okay. I may not be able to get all of the questions, but we'll start with one that is pretty interesting. Dr. Chapman answered it a little bit, but I'd like to ask you as well, um, Eve asked if there were any statistics or just your sense of this, of death from cancer versus death from cancer treatments or secondary diseases that are developing along with the cancer? Well, obviously a very, very good question. Um, you know, I obviously during all those years of practice, I spent a lot of times with oncologists, um, you know, and I always insisted that the client get a oncologist opinion before they come to me. And so I can explain what other therapies they had beside the one that I was dealing with. And you know, I always instructed the client to speak to the oncologist to see if there was any, any potential side effects of the therapy that they should be aware of. Now, obviously, we all know oncologists, they've been trained, um, and, and the answer over the number of years has always come back is that chemotherapy in animals is not like chemotherapy in people. They don't pull out all stops and kill that cancer no matter what. And therefore the side effects of chemotherapy 
in animals is nothing like it is in people. Over the years, I would say that I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I have had many, many animals had adverse side effects. And, and the way I couched that was, I said to them that they could take, if you're gonna do the chemotherapy along with the integrative therapy, then just be very vigilant. And at any point, if you find that, that, that the, the side effects or how your animal is feeling is not up to what you anticipated, you can always wean off of the chemotherapy and go on to a natural protocol. And most people really appreciated that. And, and in, in many cases, they did eventually stop the chemotherapy and went with the, with the holistic approach. So I, 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 I probably skirted around. I don't know if there is any specific studies that identify that. But my gut says, yes, there is, that there is potentially side effects that is going to shorten the life of the animal. Okay, thank you. And Jenny wanted to know, we know that mushrooms are great for treating cancer. Would you recommend using mushrooms as one of your regular supplements for the whole life of a dog? And then I'm adding to that but how many supplements are we going to give? You know, sometimes it looks like we're adding too many at one time. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree with you 100%. You know, I think medicinal mushrooms are a little bit in the uh, category by themselves. And so anytime that, that I had a client that wanted to go on either a medicinal mushroom or a, uh, uh, a herbal combination on the prevention side, I always told them, I said, listen, go on it for three weeks, stop for a week, let the body go back to normal, and then restart it. I, I am not a fan of giving remedy after remedy after remedy continually. I like to get the body to rest a little bit in between. Obviously, if you're treating with a cancer that's explosive, that's a different story. You pull out all stops. But on the, on the, on the treatment side and the prevention side, I think that those really heavy duty medicinals, that you don't have to do that on the prevention side. Okay, great, I agree. Um, and then, um, I think it was probably Jenny. Um, so talking about the plant-based diet, given that keto diet seems to help cancer, would you be recommending a plant-based diet to animals with um, cancer? Yes. To answer your question, yes. I, uh, uh, the, key, the, key, the, the research that I've done and the number of veterinarians I've spoken with, the keto diet has promised because what you're doing is obviously you're eliminating, uh, totally eliminating uh, uh, carbohydrates and allowing the body to get its energy source from fat. From a diet perspective, a high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate diet long-term is not a really good balanced diet. So I'm not a fan of it long-term, obviously on the treatment side for cancer, I think that there's a benefit for it. So to answer your question, yes. <clears throat> now, if you couple that with <clears throat> the fat, the high fat and high protein, if those high fat and high protein ingredients contain some of the pollutants like Roundup and other things that are found in feedlot, you're really exacerbating the condition. So my belief is that if we could come up with a fermented plant-based diet that has not been exposed to any of these pollutants and has the ability to produce or to, 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 to supply the proper amount of fatty acids and amino acids, I think there's a potential benefit there that could really help on the prevention of cancer. Research needs to be done. That's just my opinion. But I think that there's, there's research should be done. I believe it's important to be done. Okay, great. I think, my goodness, and we've even gotten done early here. Um, 
Dr. Jeff, Dr. Sarah, Dr. Jean, do you pick up any of the questions that you think need to be asked that I've missed? Oh, what about um, C60 for um, working with animals with lipoma because it decreases oxidative stress? I don't, I, you know, I would be, I, I don't have experience to really to answer that. That's, uh, uh, I, I just don't know. Okay. I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't know. And, and Christine, I just want to add one more thing on the plant-based diet mm -hmm. that, you know, I, that I think is important. Obviously, you and I, all of us as veterinarians have been taught that, that dogs are, uh, you know, carnivores and omnivores, and they can probably do well on a plant-based diet, but cats are obligate carnivores. I think that, that my research is showing that the, the, the new technology, obviously cats are obligate, but they're obligate to amino acids and essential fatty acids not necessarily me. Now that is a, that's an opinion, not a fact right now. So I think with the new technology of developing proteins and amino acids and fatty acids through a fermentation process has given us the ability to look at this from a different perspective. And that's where my excitement is. Um, thank you. Let's see, um, Allison was, oh no, Vanya was asking about, um, do you recommend vitamin C for pets who have cancer? And what about, um, and then I'll add in, what about IV versus um, oral? Yes, to answer your question, for the 30 years that I practiced a full time, I used intravenous vitamin C cocktails on both dogs and cats with relatively good results. Um, I, I think that there is definitely a benefit there. I think that there are other therapies that I relied on over the years that I felt were, were more in tune with the animal's body, like you know Chinese herbs specifically for uh, Chinese herbs and medicinal mushrooms you know, that had spe uh, specificity for cancer. But yes, I am a fan of intravenous vitamin C. Obviously, I came up in the era uh, you know, where it was being developed. Um, so I used it for many, many years, and I especially got good results in feline leukemia over the years mm -hmm. of, yeah. you know, of, of using uh, intravenous vitamin C on cats. So I am a fan of it. It should be done in a veterinarian's hand who is experienced in there and who knows how to do it the correct way. Now, here's something I haven't heard of. Um, Catherine asks if liposomal vitamin C is almost as good as IV. Uh, yeah, liposomal is the, the technology on liposomes has been really advanced over the past couple of years. Uh, we uh, launched last year and we'll probably uh, introduce it again this year, a liposomal CBD, which showed, uh, we tested it at uh, Colorado State University and it showed that the amount of CBD that was taken through the skin was equally to what given uh, the CBD orally. So I am a fan of it as long as it's done with natural liposomal ingredients. I think that there's tremendous potential there, and that could have you know that could eliminate the need for intravenous and do it uh, transdermal or transmucosal. Okay, Joyce actually had a great question, which relates to what I comment, you and I talked about a moment ago of giving too many supplements often. Um, Joyce asked, what are the must have supplements to boost immunity? Like the top three to add to the diet to prevent disease. Well, when I practice, I always practice from the, from the, from the position that each animal is an individual. I never use one protocol across the board. I always match the protocol based upon the physical exam, the diagnosis and what the blood was telling me. So I am a fan of making the protocol specific for the individual animal. Now, obviously, you obviously have to be a veterinarian in order to do that and not everybody can do that. But I think that the, the question was, what are the three 
top that 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 is that what it was the, yes the, the three was? top supplements to boost immunity that you would be giving to add to the diet oh wow that's a very <laughs> with all the thousands of different type of supplements out there i know um uh let's see i am uh let me see if i can just pinpoint a couple that Well, you know, I relied, I, as I told you before, I relied heavily on Chinese herbs and I relied he heavily on um, medicinal mushrooms. So I would probably say stay away from them because those are ones that I would not use as a prevention. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, a, a good quality, you know, multiple vitamin mineral is probably one that I would probably rely on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, turmeric comes, I mean, turmeric is, in my estimation, one of the herbs that is really can be given at any time and has tremendous amount of immune uh, boosting. So I would say a good multiple vitamin, uh, turmeric as, a, as an herbal to uh, boost the immune system. And uh, obviously in, in, in earth animal, we have an herbal blend of an, of an elixir, uh, of a... Uh, <clears throat> an herbal elixir, which has astragalus, uh, echinacea, and a whole bunch of natural herbal immune boosting. So I think those three would be the ones that I would go with. Okay. Yeah, well, that's... Again, Jamie's mm -hmm. number was in this presentation. Uh, Jamie can give uh, whoever is interested, uh, you know, uh, contacts for where other type of, uh, of uh, remedies are available and how they can get those. Okay, so um, then uh, somebody's reminded, they said turmeric is a blood thinner, so you probably shouldn't use it if they've got hemangiosarcoma. I, Again, yeah. you need to talk to Jamie, but what yeah, yeah. your answer for that? Yeah, one? I mean, it is a blood thinner. You know, with hemangiosarcoma, I, all the rules get thrown out. In my opinion, you are battling against the clock no matter where the hemangiosarcoma is. And I would just pull out all stops to try to stop that hemangiosarcoma, whether or not it thins the blood or not. I, it, it wouldn't even phase me uh, that I know that you have to hit hemangiosarcoma as quickly as you can. If it's in the spleen and you can remove it, obviously remove it. Obviously, if it's already gone to the liver, it's probably, probably a death sentence. But with the mangiosarcoma, I have never stopped at anything and I would use everything in my power to try to stop it. That's interesting. I have actually homeopathically treated several cases of hemangiosarcoma. One was a miniature poodle who lived um, from, I started at age 12 and she lived to age 20. And during those eight years, she had two bleeds that were only minor and we stopped them. And um, that's sensational. Believe me, and, that is sensational. And I've had about, I'd say I've probably had about three hemangios that did respond that way, but I didn't treat much cancer. So I was yeah. just lucky in finding the right remedies for those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hemangiosarcoma is this in a category by itself. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just hit it. I, I, don't, I don't pull out anything. I just hit it with everything I got. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Then, well, now, before, it is time to stop. Wind up, yeah, yeah, before okay. we wind up, um, if Dr. Bob, could you stop sharing so we can all say goodbye? You want me to cheer? No, can, stop, can sharing. Stop, stop sharing. Hit, hit that oh, stop, stop sharing. Oh, stop sharing. This no, no. Is red, hit, red button. Hit the yeah. button that says stop sharing. There yeah. you go. Okay. All there right. Go. Awesome. So, you guys are very technically savvy. I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank Go you, ahead, Dr. Dr. Bob. Jeff. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Bob, for uh, an incredible uh, hour. And thank you all for coming. And um, Dr. Christina, was there anything else you wanted to say or anyone else want to say before we go? No, uh, you were, you wanted to say maybe something about one medicine, one, one earth, but yeah, one just, health. Just, just the, the approach that Dr. Bob was talking about so that unites plants and animals and people all together is the One Health, One Medicine approach that we'll be launching um, in January, February, and March. 
um, a series of webinars on how to do that, not specifically in cancer, but just how to live a healthier life and keep uh, your guys from having um, symptoms or problems. And um, we're going to have a, a chili bundle, a bundle of webinars and other resources for anyone that wants to join us between January and March of next year. So okay. there will be more information coming. And Dr. Bob, thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, that You're was welcome. wonderful. Great to see you. Uh, Jean, Christina, Jeff, and everybody else. Nice to see you also. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye.